All right, so back to our lecture. Um, the other thing that I want to talk to people about, and you don't need to answer now, um, but uh, I have talked to the wastewater treatment plant uh, regarding the field trip, and uh, they're not, um, they might be able to accommodate us. We're still working out the details. We can't uh, send everyone in there at the same time. Um, so I'm hoping we can do it in two groups. Um, so some of us can go on a Thursday. All, be, all of us are available on a Thursday um, because of your labs. I'm not, but I might be able to uh, rearrange my schedule. Uh, the other two times they were telling me it was the following week, Monday and Tuesday. Um, I don't know what you guys' schedules are like on Mondays and Tuesdays. You guys have probably have other classes. Uh, do you have any gaps in there of about three hours other morning or afternoons? We have a gap between um, 12 and 2 o'clock on Tuesday. Okay. It's only two uh, hours. Any other times? Uh, yeah. How late are they open? Um, I think they have a shift change around three o'clock or something like that. Um, so uh, I think he said mornings for Pearl, but they can probably swing afternoon depending on on everything. Um, again, I have to have to Monday. Mondays were done at four. Okay. But I I don't like people have work and whatnot. After yeah. that's two though, so. Okay, so what uh, I'm going to do um, after class is I'm going to send you an email with this information, and if everybody could respond to me, um, the you know uh, the availability uh, and that time you said on Tuesdays, so if you could put that in the email as well, and and answer these questions, I'll, I'll put them in the email, and uh, we'll see if we can we can get something to work, and uh, that would be wonderful. So there's the heads up on that. That's a little bit of uh, it's like a month away, but. Uh, the sooner we can get the details out, the better. Okay, so this is where we finished last day. We were talking about uh, water use, and we want to talk about a few things regarding that. And uh, so we were talking about how um, so municipal water use, uh, that means a city or a town, uh, this water is going to be treated out of water. Uh, it's going to be all drinkable. And uh, so most of that goes to residential. Um, there's also commercial, industrial, and a certain amount uh, is leakage. And I had mentioned that I had read somewhere that uh, the city of Montreal, their leakage is close to 50%, which is kind of crazy. So this is um, just another graphic from, uh, I think this is from Stats Canada, and they're talking about uh, you know some of the same things, right? So like I said, industrial kind of depends on what kind of indus industry. Uh, the large ones all have their own water treatment facilities, um, but smaller industries, think about all the possibilities, right? You've got uh, gas stations, restaurants, laundromats, uh, all sorts of things that use uh, water, uh, car washes, uh, all that's basically treated water that uh, uh, is, is uh, by all intents and purposes uh, drinkable, right? Um, yeah, I feel like we talked about some of this stuff already. Maybe this is where we finished off on, on this one here. So. I'll just plow on from that. So something else uh, too that uh, Stats Canada was trying to raise some awareness over a couple of years ago was outdoor water use. Uh, a lot of people water their lawns and gardens and those kind of things and uh, depending on where you are in the country, uh, uh, a, lot, a lot of that water is uh, it's expensive, right? And we're, we're, we're um, wasting a lot of it in some ways. Uh, everyone wants green lawns though, of course, and uh, so, you know, they're talking about, I saw this was interesting, talking about cisterns and barrels and uh, how those uh, are used in uh, higher percentages in some places. And apparently Alberta, 25% of homes have these things. I had no idea. I honestly don't know if I know anybody with a, with a water barrel, um, other than like my grandparents a long time ago, which was because they lived on a farm. So. <laughs> Okay, so what I want to talk about a little bit is some of the municipal stuff and we'll talk about household stuff too. So you can see this is talking about, uh, you know, when we have um, um, a city or a town and they're treating water and uh, of course they need to figure out how much water and pressure is required for that population. And if you think about it, there's all those uses, right? We have uh, homes and, and industry and leakage. Uh, and there also has to be a certain amount of water pressure available for, for uh, firefighting as well, right? And 
So that's something that's worth uh, mentioning because, of course, uh, you know, every city, even every neighborhood is going to have uh, different requirements. Um, so this requirement for firefighting is called needed fire flow. And uh, so it, it depends on a whole bunch of things, but population, right? If you, think, you can imagine if you've got one fire hydrant and you've got, let's say, five homes. So those five homes could represent, let's say, an average of, let's say, four people in a house. So, you know, five homes, four people in a house, that's about 20 people. Um, compared to a fire hydrant, uh, let's say it's near an apartment building that has, a, let's say it's got 10 stories and that represents a couple hundred condos. So those kind of things all go into that calculation on that. And there's charts and whatnot you can, you can look up, but uh, you guys just need to know what needed fire flow actually means and be able to uh, describe it in, let's say, short answer question or something like that. Uh, here's some numbers. You can see I found this is um, uh, US numbers on that, that chart down there. So GPM is probably gallons per minute, I'm guessing. And uh, so you can see they're talking about the distance between uh, build, you know, built units and, uh, and how the, uh, as the distance uh, uh, changes, uh, the needed fire flow also changes as well. So this number here at the top I found is for, um, I, I can't remember, I think it's a Canadian number, 30 liters per second, uh, residential pressure of about 138 uh, kilopascals for at least two hours. That's quite a bit of water, right? If, Assuming there is a fire, you, you know, you want to be able to put it out. So here's something interesting. Um, this is kind of like, if you think about the day and your pattern, when are you likely to use water? Um, probably most of us, you know, we sleep at night and in the morning we get up and, you know, depending on your job or school or whatever, you're, you're waking up, uh, you know, the average person wakes up between, let's say, 6 o'clock and 8 o'clock. And somewhere in there, you've got a bunch of toilets flushing, sometimes showers, sometimes people are doing other things like throwing on a load of laundry. Um, and so there's a pretty big peak uh, in, the, in, the, in the morning hours. Um, that usually goes down during the day, but doesn't, doesn't get uh, down to zero. And then uh, there's a peak demand again when people get home, where they're doing all those same other things, you know, uh, laundry, dishes, showers, and those kind of things, and then, and then goes down. Um, so uh, we have to plan around these kind of patterns when we're producing waters in cities, right? And, and to realize that demand is going to be high during certain peak periods. This is something interesting. Um, I kind of asked this question uh, when we go to the water uh, treatment plants, um, and it's kind of one of those questions I try to remember to ask every year, uh, whether we follow all of those normal patterns. And uh, I've had both answers where some of the technicians have said, yeah, we follow a pretty normal pattern, you know, in the mornings and evenings, uh, water demand goes up. Uh, and then I've also had some say that, no, we don't have a pattern, we're Fort McMurray, we have a lot of, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, chef workers. Um, so it's always interesting to see what they say uh, regarding this kind of thing. But like I said, usually they have an idea of how much water they're going to need. And um, a city like Fort McMurray, uh, both water treatment plants have been upgraded. And I can't remember what the capacity is. It's something like 120,000 people. So we're, we're good for capacity unless the city grows uh, quite a bit more, because I think we're at roughly around, you know, something like 70 or 80,000 residents at the moment. Um, but they have planned for increased demand just in case the, the town does expand. And it's always a good idea to, you know, not be close to your limit you never know when there's going to be an issue where you need water like um i don't know a giant forest fire or something in 2016 right so what about our homes um this is uh, this is about the approximation of uh the water they use for home the big ones are toilets and showers followed by laundry kitchen and drinking i think i have some actual numbers here i have in a moment um but uh all, all these numbers are going to vary right? Just based on, on who you are. Some people like long showers, some people have more frequent baths, uh, you know, and it's going to have to do with your plumbing too. If you live in a newer home, uh, it's likely you're going to have uh, more uh, efficient plumbing. Um, I put a new toilet in my house a few years ago, and I'm pretty sure it uses, you know, probably a third of the amount of water my previous toilet used. Uh, it uses way, way less. Uh, newer um, dishwasher is going to be more efficient than an older dishwasher, all those kind of things. So I think I should do these kind of numbers as well, uh, kind of average daily consumption. Canada is uh, 
kind of on the higher end because our water is, is relatively cheap. Um, so what was this all about? I'm trying to remember what I was going to say uh, about this here. Uh, I guess these are just some numbers for um, the average Fort McMurray household. Uh, and so this is assuming an average household of five people, I guess. I uh, can't remember where I got these numbers from, but I thought this was interesting that apparently we are lower consumers of Fort McMurray than uh, the Canadian average. Actually, I know what this is now. Um, this is numbers from my house. That's where I got those numbers, right? You get the water bill, it tells you how much water you consumed. Um, so I pulled out one of my old water bills. Yeah, so this is, this is apparently how much I'm using in my household. So, um, you know, I don't know, bigger people probably use more water than the smaller people would be my guess. I should pull up a, a recent bill and see if we're still on, on par because maybe that March and April of 2019 was a, a low usage and we're spending a lot more time at home. So I'm, uh, nowadays, so I'm assuming our, our average consumption is a little higher. Um, so this is some other data I found. It's a little older data, but just showing that the average consumption does it seem to be going down. And this probably has a lot to do with just efficiencies put in systems and like I said, newer plumbing and things like that can actually can actually help. So here's some numbers. I was looking up these numbers. There's a whole bunch of different sources, and there's always huge range in these numbers. Like I said, partly just due to habits. Uh, you know, some people apparently leave the water running the entire time they brush their teeth. Um, you know, if you don't leave the water running, you're going to use a lot less water uh, for obvious reasons. And um, I know my nephew was showing me this fancy washing machine he got. Um, and uh, it, it's, it, had, it still had all the stickers on it and being super efficient. And I can't remember how much water it said it was using per load, but it was it's like a really small number, like 10 liters or something like that. And I couldn't believe you could run a load of laundry on, on 10 liters. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So um, just wondering if anyone else did this measurement. Um, I forgot to do it, but I called home this morning and asked somebody to do it. And this is what they measured. Uh, 630 milliliters for five seconds of shower. Anyone else get a chance to do that? I did for my son's bath. Yeah, so um, how, how much water over five or 10 seconds? I'm curious. Okay, so over 10 seconds. Uh, sorry, my calculations are all over the place. It was 2.25 kilograms of water in 10 seconds. And then I figured it out that it was 339 seconds total for the bath so then that was uh 76.25 liters a day so it was about like i calculated in a year it would be around twenty eight thousand liters just for our son okay wow well, yeah i think that's pretty typical oh some i'm getting some echo there i don't know what's happening there but uh um yeah that's pretty typical about 75 liters for uh for a bath yeah um i'll show you some numbers here i just calculated mine um, so if I took a five minute shower, which it's been a while since I've done a shower that short, <laughs> especially in the winter, I get stuck in there because it's nice and warm. Um, but that's 37 uh, liters approximately. And How long so, a, oh, sorry. I'll let you finish playing. Oh yeah. I was just going to say, so if you get one of these, uh, these drinking jugs from the grocery store, that's 19 liters. So that's approximately two of those jugs worth. Um, I'm not exactly sure how long I normally have a shower for, but I'm guessing around uh, probably double that, maybe 10 minutes. So my 10 minute shower is probably pretty equivalent to your, your son's bath would be my guess. Um, how, long have you, uh, how long have you had a shower in the winter? Have you ever gone more than 10 minutes? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. I had one, um, I'm trying to remember recently, maybe it was a couple weeks ago, I went skiing and I was really cold and I remember I just jumped in the shower afterwards and um, I don't know how long I was stuck there, but it was quite a while, long enough to feel that the hot water was running out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I had calculated that um, approximate uh, typical bath is 75 liters and that's uh, about one, one third uh, full. So, it's going to vary. You know, there's different types of shower heads and stuff out there. I was trying to look into um, uh, different types of shower heads and, uh, and there's, there's a lot that are, uh, you know, water efficient. Um, 
I was trying to find out because I remember a long time ago, my parents had this one that was definitely not water efficient and probably let a lot more water and, in, a, in a short amount of time as well. So here's some other numbers here. Oh yeah, okay, I did find some numbers, some older shower heads, there we go. I couldn't remember where I found those numbers, but uh, you can see the uh, idea in, in efficiencies anyway. Uh, I saw some on Amazon that were supposed to be highly efficient and apparently six liters a minute. I, I thought that was interesting. I you know, don't know how they do it and can actually get your, <laughs> get enough water on your, uh, on your shampoo to, to do the job, but um, you know, I think there was um, I think there's a Seinfeld episode about that where they were complaining about uh, having these <laughs> efficient water um, uh, shower heads that weren't, weren't doing the job. So um, here's, here's a difference, right? You know, if you take about um, how much you're saving and all that uh, in terms of efficiencies and, you know, if you get a chance to, need to buy a new appliance uh, at some point in your life, uh, you know, take a look at that. Um, it, it might be worth your time to get something that's a little bit more efficient. Uh, I know there's a lot of things that go into appliances, obviously cost and things like that. And like, uh, so I had experience, I bought a dishwasher about a year and a half ago. And um, all the salespeople, they, they didn't want to talk about electricity or water or anything like that, which were questions I was asking. They all want to talk about how quiet it is. Because apparently that is the number one thing a customer looks for in a dishwasher is how quiet it is, right? Um, of course, the question I have is, are the quieter ones less efficient and they're not gonna wash my dishes? Um, the salespeople couldn't answer those questions. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was something I was looking at and I noticed that the newer models, they all seem to be uh, uh, a lot less per load. I don't remember the exact number um, they said per load, but um, if I looked at it, because you could usually find on the, in the stores, uh, you know, this year's model, last year's model, and usually, usually about three years worth of models. So what about, um, you know, drips and things like that? Um, I've had some issues at my house with one of the taps. I had to kind of get deep into the plumbing to, to uh, deal with it with a drip. And uh, uh, here's some numbers anyway, uh, depending on, on actual um, size of the drip and, and all that. And I found this from um, the uh, uh, city website. I can't remember what it's called, uh, Fort McMurray Water or something like that. Uh, and, and this is this is the numbers that they calculated anyway. So I think I'd mentioned that um, uh, South Africa uh, and like it looks like it's Cape Town was issuing the uh, 50 liter challenge to people. Uh, so what does 50 liters a day look like? And according to them, uh, this is right from their website, uh, 10 liters a day for washing. Um, that's not a lot of water, <laughs> if you think about it, right? Like I said, if the average person is, let's, let's just throw that number 75 liters down. Um, you know, so that's like, uh, you know, a one minute shower um, or, you know, kind of putting some water in a bowl and splashing your face and, and getting some of the critical regions cleaned out, I guess is the idea <laughs> behind that. Although I guess not everyone necessarily has to take a shower every day, uh, that kind of thing. But now imagine washing uh, a load of, of uh, laundry on 10 liters, uh, same thing, right? And depending on the size of your family, uh, sometimes uh, you know, that washing machine is running like crazy and other times maybe not so often. If you're, if you're single and living alone, it's obviously gonna be a lot less. Um, flushing a toilet, uh, you can see they have some tips there. They're telling, telling people to, uh, you know, if, if you're just going number one, uh, maybe not flush as often, because they were really trying to conserve water. Uh, it was at a really critical point. So here's um, some, an infographic I found on the CBC News that covered it as well. And they were saying, okay, average person in Canada flushes the toilet five times a day, apparently. Uh, if you're in Cape Town, you get one flush. That's all you're allowed. Uh, showers one minute. Okay, there we go. I don't know why they got the average of Canadian having a four minute shower. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know if anybody does that. Okay, so where are we at time here? We are one thirty. So let's talk a little bit about municipal water systems and uh, kind of some of the, uh, the structure behind what we're looking at, right? So obviously you're gonna have a source and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these and treatment is a whole other unit, but uh, 
each of these I've got a little bit to talk about. So water sources uh, in Canada, a very high percentage of our water sources are from, uh, from lakes and rivers. Uh, sometimes uh, lakes and rivers, just in terms of treatment, are often put into two separate categories. Uh, partly because rivers will have more sediment. You've got moving water, and uh, the moving water often uh, you know, adds sediment and silt and clay and whatnot to the, to the water a little bit as well. Um, some places in Canada are using groundwater, and uh, processing um, just may depend on what exactly is in the ground. Uh, sometimes groundwater can be quite pristine, and sometimes it can be uh, full of, of certain minerals and, or dissolved gases and other things. Uh, Blaine. Yes. You, you know, uh, uh, you know, last Tuesday, um, uh, we in ENVT 165, uh, we actually went outside and did like uh, water sampling in that well, uh, you know, that little oh, yeah. by the powers lab. Uh, was that we with Neil? Some, uh, work over there. Was that with Neil? Huh? Was that with Neil? No, it was with Marie France. Okay, cool. Yeah, because last I heard, um, <laughs> We had had lost the key for it. <laughs> we were talking about it a Actually, couple of weeks there's ago. A, there's a well around the school. Yeah, it's a that. it's a sampling well. It's over by the um, whatever that building is, the engineering processing la uh, building lab or whatever. The power engineering lab. Yes, that's what it is. Yeah. So Neil um, was the one who got that put in about maybe maybe six years ago. Yeah. So uh, it's it's a sample. Is it, well. is it right by the? Is it uh, is it right by where? Um, is it right by where the building where um, where uh, all the generators are? Where all like the pipes that? are. Where all where all the yeah. pipes are. Yeah. 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 If you, if you walk past the Bob Land building, you'll like probably see it. Yeah. yeah. It's it's not obvious. It looks like just a little pipe sticking out of the ground because it's a sampling well, and uh, it's a pretty typical kind of sampling well that. Um, you know the city has them all around around uh, around town, and uh, you know those are the type of things that would be near, let's say, landfills and whatnot, and they uh, they would sample them frequently. Um, you, you know what's uh, you know what's interesting, like how um, how like uh, here, like our pipes, we have our pipes like cold, what what more better suited the weather resistant to the cold, like yeah. it takes a lot of cold for them to put burst and then like insulation but like uh compared to uh, the water at emergency texas had last month where mm -hmm. all those pipes exploded and like millions of people had no water or electricity yeah yeah well um my, yeah and, and we changed too like uh depending on the, the the age of your building um we have uh different standards right then the newer standards are, are, are stricter uh, so, for example, my, my brother lives in Yellowknife, and um, you can imagine they get a lot more intense cold there. And what they do uh, when they, uh, they put water under the ground to your house, um, so he had this happen to his house, by the way, because it was, it was built in 1985. And so when it happened and the water froze up, they dug up his yard, and the new water system constantly had the water flowing in kind of a little loop. Uh, in order to prevent it actually from freezing up. And so that's kind of a, a mitigation. But you're right, yeah, in Canada, we're assuming the worst for the weather, <laughs> and we're a bit more prepared for it. Texas, they were not expecting to have, uh, what did they get, to minus 20 or something like that? Yeah, remember that uh, polar vortex we had? It actually yeah. went down. It, it went down there. It caused those storms. Yeah, I'm lucky for them, eh? Yeah, and, the, and then uh, did you know that Texas, actually, did you know that Texas... So uh, Texas actually generates its own electricity. It's not a part of. Uh, it's not a. It has its own separate grid than uh, um, than the grid we are on, like uh, like the western grid or the eastern grid, because we trade our power. We share electricity with the states as well. We produce uh, some. We we produce. Uh, we generate more power actually. So I guess being on their own grid uh, worked to their disadvantage this time, hey. Yeah, because they didn't have any uh, outlier, like they didn't just share any line from neighboring states. They could have uh, prevented this like uh, 80 years ago, but yeah, when the grid went out, a lot of cities lost power. But like El Paso, they had they actually didn't lose it. But yeah, 
Anyway, um, I'm going to move on and talk about water sources a little bit. Uh, so some of these things we talked about, I think I showed you this graph before and just kind of mentioned that most of our water is from surface water and uh, apparently 94% in Alberta. Um, and I showed you this chart or this, uh, this table as well, uh, talking about what's going on in Wood Buffalo. So we get our water from the Athabasca River. Probably no surprise there, it's the biggest river going through town, so the most obvious uh, source. But um, if you're from one of these other places like Fort Chip, or uh, I'm not sure why I have Fort Chip on there twice, how did that happen? Uh, but or if you're from um, Jean Vier or, or Conklin or any of these other places, uh, you're going to have, uh, you know, whatever is, is on hand, and we have a lot of those things on hand around here. So one of the things that happens uh, when we take in our water, usually there's some sort of grading uh, or, or, or system to, you know, you're, you're trying to prevent fish, and sticks, and those kind of things getting in. And uh, that's kind of usually the very first part of the, uh, the water treatment system. Like I said, it's a grading or something like that to uh, uh, filter out the, the large things. Um, you see these kind of things in wells. I think I showed you this diagram before. Um, usually wells have an intake somewhere down at the bottom and uh, it's, uh, it's going to be filtered to some sort of screen or grating to prevent uh, uh, large particulates. There's another picture of a well. So treatment, uh, like I said, we're going to talk about treatment um, in another unit, but uh, uh, you know, one thing worth it to think about treatment is why are we doing it? Uh, the obvious one is because people are consuming the water, uh, they're drinking it and putting it in their food. So uh, it has to be uh, a pretty high standard in terms of uh, you know, safety, right? We can't have certain chemicals in there. We can't have uh, things that are gonna make us sick, uh, such as uh, certain types of microbes, those kind of things. Uh, but there are other goals of water treatment. Uh, People also want their water to look and smell nice. Um, I think it's obvious, but uh, that's not necessarily always the case of water. It doesn't necessarily, just because it tastes bad, it doesn't mean it's bad for you. Um, if you've ever uh, you know, lived on a farm or in a rural area where you get well water, um, you're probably a little bit more familiar with this kind of thing than, than other people. My parents had a well when I was growing up. And um, during some seasons, I think, I'm just trying to remember now, I think it was spring or was it fall, I can't remember, um, the water would, it would get a color to it. It was kind of a little bit of a yellowish tinge. And you would see that in, you know, the bathtub or, or the toilet, uh, you know, just that when the color started to change. And, um, you know, it, I wouldn't say it necessarily tasted worse. Uh, again, it kind of depends on what you're familiar with. I personally really hated city water. I didn't like the chlorine. I always liked well water much better because uh, that's what I was used to. Um, but we did have the water tested, uh, you know, several times over the years and there were no concerns. I think it was high in iron and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Iron is actually good for you um, was, the, was the biggest find of it. And it was uh, relatively hard water as well. Um, Blaine? Yep. Um, it, um, wait, what was I? Oh, yeah, you said that... Uh, Drinking water has to have uh, a concentration of like uh, 500 parts per million, right? Uh, uh, or less, yes. Yeah, if it's higher than 500, it uh, usually starts to taste salty. Yeah. So would, would, would brackish water be considered salty? Yes, for sure. Yeah, the water that you guys are testing in the lab, I think is something like, um, I can't remember, but I think it's like 1500 or something like that. So it would definitely be tasting pretty salty. Uh, and, and it actually might be much higher, I can't remember. Um, but you'll find out this week or next week, because you're going to be doing a solids lab uh, this week, I believe. And yeah. uh, so you get an actual measurement yeah. of it. Yeah, and this I week that, I think we're going to be doing like in the lab, and the next week we're going to be continuing when it's going to be on computer. Yeah, so you'll, you'll, get, a, you'll get a value for, for us on that, and you'll see what, how that compares to the tap water as well. Mm-hmm. So you can see on the list here, the third thing is because sometimes there's industries, right? And so, you know, you can imagine a laundromat is a good example of an industry in town that would use water and they're not gonna want water that's dirty or is gonna stain everybody's clothes. Uh, some places may actually uh, have a secondary treatment, uh, reverse osmosis or something like that, if they need to clean up the water even more than, uh, than what the city does. So we'll talk about reverse osmosis a little bit later too, by the way. 
So where do the costs come in for this whole system? Um, the treatment, obviously you're gonna have a plant and that's gonna include you know, staff and chemicals and, and those kind of things. Uh, a big part of the, uh, the water cost though is also distribution, right? Getting it out to everybody. You got all this piping that's going on under the, under the ground, uh, getting to everybody. And then obviously the last part of it is, uh, is the treatment, right? Uh, uh, wastewater treatment, you know, we, we can't just, uh, you know, dump our sewer uh, into, the, uh, into the, the river anymore. We can't do that anymore. Uh, so this is uh, a number I was able to find, and apparently the average household of four pays about $965, at least in 2013. And uh, I never did pull up my uh, water bills to see how that compared. I'm trying to think. I feel like I just had one recently, and it was, um, I feel like it was about $100 a month, but then that doesn't, it doesn't just include the water in there. I think it includes the garbage pickup and a couple other service fees on there. Uh, so that's that uh, basically confirms about $965 a year. So I don't think it's gone up too much. So this is a little schematic. They used to have a, a cute little uh, website uh, run by the municipality called conservewater.ca. Uh, I took this picture, it's not up there anymore, but it was an animated little thing. And you can see they're trying to show you what goes on. You've got the river, goes through a screen, and then we've got these, uh, these reservoirs. Uh, and uh, that's what you can see sometimes when you're driving over the bridge, these just basically these massive ponds. And uh, those are there to give the water a chance to settle out. Uh, there is a lot of clay in the Athabasca River. And if we brought it uh, directly into the plant, it would gum up everything really quickly. So it basically sits there for a couple of days before it gets a chance to go into the station. So you can see in the station, there's a few things going on. We're gonna talk about coagulation here, there's clarifiers, uh, filtration systems and eventually we add some chemicals and then eventually it goes out to the households. So much more on that, like I said, coming up very soon. Uh, so another part is the distribution and um, often you'll hear uh, city workers talking about these things, the water mains. And by water main, they really just mean the, the main water distribution pipes that are found under the ground and uh, they're bringing water to uh, you know all the homes and, and businesses and fire hydrants and those kind of things. Uh, the distribution system is going to include a whole bunch of other engineering things. You can see some examples of some things that are going to be in there. So pumps, valves, uh, meters, uh, various service lines, those kind of things. So this is showing uh, kind of um, something else that you see in a lot of towns, which is a water tower. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, obviously between the home and this water source, that's where the water treatment plant is gonna be. So this is kind of a little schematic showing in all these homes, you've got these big lines, these water mains, these are pretty big. There's gonna be valves in the system, there's fire hydrants, uh, a lot of homes have water meters. So I think that's standard now in most uh, places in Canada that are larger than a certain population. Um, I'm not sure whether there's a law around that in terms of water meters or whatnot. I know my hometown, uh, they still don't have water meters in their home. So I imagine just everyone's getting charged a flat rate uh, by the municipality or something like that. So here's some water mains and uh, you can see my note there is that they're generally uh, at least 150 millimeters, about six inches uh, minimum. Uh, they can be much larger. Uh, usually when they put them in, they're, they're also thinking about uh, these things will eventually, uh, with both hard water, uh, start to scale up and get narrower and narrower over time. So they have to kind of build in uh, extra capacity for that and extra capacity for leakage, which is something that will happen eventually as well. So what was I gonna say about pipes? I can't remember. Um, but there's some notes there about, you know, obviously they have to meet the demand, pressure requirements, all those kind of things. So here's some scaling. Like I said, you know, kind of this is an inevitability uh, with hard water is that these pipes are going to build up and scale and that can eventually cause uh, problems uh, where you've got breaks in the water lines. So one other consideration when cities are being built or new neighborhoods is trying to figure out the best way to deliver the water and what if there is a break or a service call or something like that. So the best systems are these ones here, these Gridarian 
or grid type networks, right? And you can see that, uh, so if we have uh, an issue over here uh, at A, we can still get water pretty much to any part of the system. If you have kind of this dead end system, if you have a water break at A, then everyone over in this neighborhood is gonna have problems. Um, usually this is a geography thing though, right? You can just imagine that you, you can't, it's, it's unavoidable sometimes to have dead end areas uh, based around, uh, you know, you, you can't build pipes in certain areas, uh, the city design, you can't go through that hill or you've got bedrock or you've got all sorts of other issues. So there's some notes here on pump stations. I'm not going to talk a lot about pump stations. Um, let's see here. But let's talk about water towers. Um, I used to think we didn't have any water towers in Fort McMurray because I couldn't find any, but uh, two things happened. I learned about some of our reservoirs and I found a water tower. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. So let's talk about what I, that... Oh, yeah, I actually... Uh, oh, sorry. So I actually, okay, so I've lived uh, in twice in my life, I lived in this province twice, right? I actually used to live in a really small town called Two Hills at, at a water tower. Yeah, I've heard it. Yeah. And basically, the basically general function that I remember of a water tower is if, like, uh, so, like, if, say, it's a town, like, has its own, like, water supply, it's not connected to, like, say, city, like that, just water there. Mm -hmm. We've had it once or twice in the winter where the pipes of the water tower froze, and so the and the water went off for everyone in town. Oh yeah, well of course. So yeah. I just want to uh, talk about why we have a water tower uh, or water systems like this. It's because of this. So you got this issue where everybody at 7 a.m. wants to have their shower. Um, we don't have enough pumps to be able to meet this kind of demand. Most cities do not. So the idea behind a water tower, I think I have a note here, is uh, basically it will fill up when the demand is low. So the idea is, you know, you've got those night hours where nobody is flushing the toilets and the water demand is very minimal and water can get pumped up there relatively slowly. And then, uh, and then now we have a bunch of water. Remember we were talking about last week, how you have uh, uh, higher that the water is, the more pressure there is in a system. And uh, so the water tower can empty out uh, when the demand is high. And so it's a pretty cool system, right? Because, you know, you're kind of constantly pumping water. Your pumps are not getting overworked. Uh, they're just sort of pumping at a low rate. And uh, when the water uh, demand is high, uh, we can just empty out the water tower. So it's pretty cool. There's another uh, picture showing one. Now, often people will, um, uh, they will try to build water towers at high places because the more height and elevation you can get off of these things, uh, the more pressure you can actually put into the system. So this is showing that you can see this water tower is up on a hill and anything that's lower than the water tower, there's enough pressure to get the water in there. So you can see there's a, looks like a shower and some laundry and a bathtub and a toilet. And that toilet is lower than the water pressure at two. So it should be no problem to get the water there. I think I have a similar picture from showing um, uh, a reservoir in, in uh, New York City in Manhattan. Um, and apparently uh, it's high enough for up to 67 stories, uh, which of course for a place like New York City, which has a lot of really tall buildings, um, this, is, this is actually a good system, right? Uh, because you can deliver it to almost every building, uh, at least a high percentage of building, most of the floors uh, with no extra added pumps or other infrastructure. So pretty simple system, but, um, uh, it, but it works. So I was gonna show you this. This is something else cool about water towers. Um, you may notice some of these old school ones, they have these, um, these bands on them, right? And uh, this is an old wooden one. And notice the band, you know, the bands are, uh, are, are closer together at the bottom. And it makes sense. If you think about this, if, imagine I had, let's say 500 kilograms of water here, or 550 or whatever, 50 kilograms of water here, and I have another 50 here, but this is actually 50 plus 50. So the, um, the further down you go, the more reinforcement you need because you're actually supporting a lot more water. So that's why you see those bands on, these, on some of these ones. There are metal ones like that with bands. So I know we're almost out of time. I just want to show you a couple of other things. Here is the Fort McMurray water tower I found. Anyone know where that is? 
It's just a little one. So isn't that a, that's in the, that's at the Syncrete Athletic Park. It is, yeah. So the Syncrete Athletic Park, um, I'm trying to think of the name of that street that it's on. Uh, it's uh, kind of halfway between um, Timberley and Thickwood. Uh, and there's some soccer, baseball, and uh, skateboard park there. So, so it's right in between uh, Cartier Drive and that. Like, that's and the one. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, it was Cartier Drive I was thinking about. Um, we do have some reservoirs in Fort McMurray. There's a big one up in, um, in Avisan, which is elevated, that helps support the downtown area. Uh, why we don't have more of them, I don't really know. Uh, but maybe that's a good question for me to ask next time I go on a tour, uh, talk to these guys. Just want to finish off and show you a few more water towers. I thought there's some pretty cool ones out there. Um, the Spruce Grove one is nice and painted and has a prairie scene on it. And there's uh, these are some other cool ones. You can see the one in the middle is a place called Rosamont. And they've uh, shaped it and colored it like a nice rose. So that's kind of cool. Um, how about some of these ones? Uh, flying saucers, pineapples, ketchup. Um, you know, why not, right? If you're going to have a big giant thing in the sky, you may as well make it kind of interesting. And of course, Lego Batman, that's kind of, you know, my favorite one, of course. So, all right, that's where we are going to finish off today. And um, I guess we'll see you on Wednesday. So look forward to that email and you can respond to me um, sooner the better. And then we can try to organize the, uh, the field trip. All right. Thanks, William. Thank all right. you. Thank you very much.